Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you for coming along today. Uh, we've had a sellout uh, event. Um, so it looks as if people uh, are, uh, do understand the importance of food for neighborhood democracy. Um, I'm going to go uh, straight ahead um, and um, with uh, a, pres a short presentation about food in the neighborhood. Can you all see this? Yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, but to begin with, um, here's the, um, the lineup of speakers today. Um, what we've done is we've put together a, a varied cast from uh, the, the world of uh, food um, to bring out some different uh, experiences of food organizing. Um, some different kinds of uh, case studies, um, beginning with uh, Cara Bilson talking about um, food in Hull and the focus there on food insecurity and the right to food. Um, and then Tessa Trix from the Hubbub um, Trust is going to introduce her colleague Liam Sweeney, who's going to be talking about community fridges and other Hubbub initiatives. Um, and then we move on to Ian Chambers from Brighton uh, on local food enterprise. Uh, Brighton is famous for its food partnership and uh, its collaborative enterprises. And then finally, um, Vera Sakharov is going to be talking on behalf of the Sustainable Food Places um, initiative about a national framework for a systemic approach to food. Um, I want to begin though with. Um, there's, a, there's a request to just blow up your screen or to use the play function so that the whole slide is showing. Good idea. Yeah. Uh, that's better, isn't it? <clears throat> um, but first, I thought I'd begin with um, a short context about where we are where we've come from. Um, 2021, the year of the lockdown, has been a bumpy year in many respects. It certainly has been for the supermarkets who've grown, uh, particularly at the expense of the hospitality sector. Um, and for the most part, they've kept full shelves throughout that period. Um, they've benefited from growing interest in um, online sales and deliveries and Tesco alone has uh, taken on more than 50,000 workers to help with their online deliveries. Um, unfortunately, it's also been a bumpy year for food banks. And um, a recent report from the Food Standards Agency and Demos uh, reckons that around about 16% of households have become food insecure in, in the course of the last year. And all of this despite the best efforts of Marcus Rashford. Finally, it's been a bumpy year for the people who are producing fruit and veg boxes and organizing farm gate sales. Um, many of them have simply struggled to keep up with the demand. Well, what are the prospects um, post lockdown? Uh, it looks as if, of course, the supermarkets are going to maintain their supremacy in the grocery market, despite having a ruinous business model. Ruinous in the sense that the sales are driven primarily by high calorie processed foods, um, helped by the fact that they pay the least they can to the producers. If you look at the whole of the value added food chain, something less than 10% goes to the people who actually grow the food as opposed to the people who sell it and process it. Um, the other thing which the supermarkets are famous for is perpetuating industrial agriculture. And nonetheless, and maybe as a result of all of these things, the supermarkets have been able to offer all the year round an unrivaled display of produce from every corner of the world. The other thing which has to be said about post lockdown is that it looks as if a growing number of households are going to be dependent on food banks and the distribution of surplus food. 
On the other hand, more positively, um, planet friendly food businesses, artisan producers of food, uh, small scale growers of food, all of these have been doing well, but they continue to be small scale and fragmented almost wherever you look. More and more, um, we're beginning to talk about alternatives to this. And one way of talking about an alternative to the whole supermarket wholesaler food processor system is to talk about farmer friendly supply chains, farmer friendly in the sense that they pay a better income and farmer friendly in the sense that they don't strangle the producer and don't force the producer into anti planetary um, processes. So the aim of a farmer friendly supply chain is to, first of all, reduce the supply chain, but also to, to boost producer income, uh, boost the supply of good and affordable food, and also to reduce food waste and food poverty. Yeah. The problem is, um, as I mentioned, despite a big leap forward for those kinds of producers, uh, they only constitute a tiny part of the food market. <coughs> They face endemic problems, underinvestment. For example, here in Sheffield recently, Food Hall, which has been doing stupendous work during the lockdown um, in supplying ready meals and boxes, um, um, have at very short notice lost the use of um, their warehouse and have been struggling to find a, a replacement premises. Um, and all of this is typical of the hand-to-mouth existence of um, the small-scale uh, uh, producers and um, artisan makers of food. Um, and the fact that the whole thing is very fragmented um, adds up to less than the sum of its parts. So how do we go towards a more coherent system? Um, well, my proposal, which is based on the research into what is actually happening in this country and also abroad, especially in the United States, is that what we need is a, a combination of food hubs and food centers. Um, I'll explain a bit more in a moment about what I mean about hubs and centers, but the central function has got to be about bringing together, aggregating, um, localized production of food and distributing it. Um, they have to build on existing strengths, um, they have to build on the existing neighborhood support networks, which the movement for neighborhood democracy is associated with and is supported, but, and also the growing appeal of artisan produce. Um, they have to be linked together through a local food partnership rather than operating in isolation. And judging by the experience of food hubs in the United States, their best hope for viability is if they focus primarily, initially, on the institutional and hospitality sector, um, hospitals, schools, those sorts of uh, consumers, uh, because that's where scale is. Um, and that linked with public procurement can secure a degree of viability, which is very, very difficult to secure otherwise. Um, alongside uh, the aggregation and distribution of food, the other functions of food hubs have got to be about providing such um, things as social supermarkets, community cafes, supporting food startups and incubators, running cookery courses, technical support for small producers, and also managing surplus food distribution in their area. And uh, this is a, a kind of a, a vision of what that system might be. Um, we talk about health centres, um, children's centres, we have primary schools and neighbourhoods, so why not food centres as well? Um, food centres I see as the neighbourhood level of a, a town or city system uh, which focuses on a food hub. The food hub is where the food is aggregated and distributed. Um, it has the large scale stuff like incubator units, uh, technical support for producers and urban farming, kitchens, and it's also the headquarters of the local food partnership. Um, the local food centers 
of the places where you go um, for food support, um, for um, a, a local social supermarket, for, so for surplus food distribution, for cooking courses, those kinds of things. So that's the vision, a food centre in every neighbourhood, uh, a food hub in every town or city. And um, that reference um, in the headline is to a piece I've written, which is on the Sustain website, which sets out some more of the evidence for this approach. Um, and the idea is that these hubs should be linked to local food policy frameworks, local food policy partnerships, and they shouldn't be standalone. They should integrate with other local services and activities. And above all, they should have local people, not just as uh, users, but also managers of these services. So we're talking about community owned and run businesses, as with the food hubs in the United States drawing on public investment sources, including local economic partnerships. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs>